So what I'm going to do in this uh, hour or so, or 45 minutes, is talk about the bacterial cell structure. And these are going to be the things that a cell needs in order to grow, divide, cause disease, whatever it's going to do. And this is my little drawing of a bacteria, and we're going to start on the outside. So the first thing I want to point out is the membrane. And the membrane, also called the cytoplasmic membrane, so the membrane is what keeps a bacteria or any cell separate from the rest of the world. All of your cells are surrounded by membranes, and they're needed to um, yeah, basically keep their guts inside. You can think of them as a balloon or something around the cell. And the membrane, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the membrane because it becomes very important with antibiotic resistance. The membrane is made up of something called a phospholipid bilayer. And it acts as a barrier between the environment and the inside of the cell. What I've drawn here is a slice showing uh, a phospholipid bilayer. But of course, it's three-dimensional. It goes all around the cell. And what this phospholipid bilayer actually is, it's made up of identical or mostly identical subunits, each of which have a little tail in the orange-yellow here and a little circle on the top. The little circle on the top is hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means water-loving. So this is the part that is going to be exposed to the outside world or the inside of the cell. It likes water. In the center here, these tails are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, afraid of water, meaning they don't want to be exposed to water. An example of this is oil. Oil, if you put oil in water, it tends to clump together. Phospholipids are the same. If you put phospholipids in water, they will form little um, bubbles by themselves just to protect them, protect the inner tails from water. So this is the basic structure of all phospholipid membranes in all organisms, as shown here. Now, the membrane keeps molecules from leaving the cell or from entering the cell. So in other words, molecules on the outside can't go in and from the inside can't go out. However, that can create a problem for the cell. Can you think what that might be? So if it's completely sealed off from the outside world, could that create a problem? Discuss for 30 seconds. It can't take up energy, specifically food in a general sense. It can't take up anything from the outside into the cell and it can't get rid of anything toxic. So you have to have some way of going through a membrane. And what you have are membrane proteins. So embedded in this membrane are proteins, and I'll talk more about proteins in a moment, which allow the transport of molecules through the cell membrane. They're usually quite specific, meaning that not just anything can go through, but for things that the cell wants to go through, like glucose, for example, food, will tra be transported through these membranes. They can form little channels through the membrane. So you absolutely have to have these membrane proteins. And this is true in all cells. So that's what a membrane is. But bacteria also have a layer on top of the membrane. So the membrane is showing black here, but then you have this gray layer here, and we call that the cell wall. And the cell wall is outside the cytoplasmic membrane, and I'm going to describe that now. So I mentioned that there are different shapes of bacteria, but there's also another characteristic that is very uh, diagnostic for what type of bacteria you have. And that is something called gram stain. 
And this was uh, invented around 150 years ago or so. So this is a very old technique, which stains bacteria either pink or purple, depending on some characteristics they'll come to. So in this example, the pink ones are called gram-negative, and they're gram-negative rod shapes or bacilli. And the purple ones here are gram-positive cocci, so they're round. So this, most bacteria are separated into the, these two categories. So what's the difference? What's the difference between a gram-positive and gram-negative? Well, it all has to do with the cell wall. A gram-positive bacteria has this kind of shape, uh, structure. So you have the cytoplasmic membrane that I drew before. I didn't include the proteins, but they're there. And on top of it, you have something called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is made up of a linking set of molecules such that it's kind of like a stiff neck. Net. So if you think of a tennis net, so you've got uh, holes in between, but you have strong connections between all around. This gram positive has many, many layers of this peptidoglycan. glycan. So it has a very thick set of peptidoglycan. glycan. On the other hand, Gram-negative bacteria look like this. They've got a cytoplasmic membrane, as before, but they have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan and then a second membrane. So they have a double membrane in gram-negative bacteria. The function of this peptidoglycan is primarily to give the cell its shape. So it determines if the cell is rod-shaped or a circle or a corkscrew or anything like that. So the peptide lichen is necessary to keep the cell's shape. And molecules can move fairly freely through the peptide glycan. Some examples of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria are here. Gram-positive Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Gram-negative E. coli or salmonella are both gram-negatives. So here's another little question for you. Some antibiotics target only gram-negative and some only gram-positive bacteria. Can you think why that might be? So think about that one for a minute. Because the cell wall of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria differ, antibiotics act differently on them. First, the physical properties of the cell wall makes it easier or more difficult for the antibiotic to enter. And second, as you'll hear later, some antibiotics target the enzymes, in, especially for peptidoglycan, that are different between the two bacteria. In addition, this is more general. Other enzymes also differ between gram-positive and gram-negative. Any further questions about that? Okay. So now I'm continuing from the outside of the cell. So we did the membrane, cytoplasmic membrane, and the extra membrane for gram-negatives. The cell wall for cell shape. And then you've got a capsule or slime layer on most bacteria. The capsule and slime layer are for two functions. One is protection. So you can imagine if you have, I mean, it, it's called slime because it's slimy. It's um, very icky. Uh, you can imagine some molecules can't go through the slime. And so that's a layer of protection. It's protection against a number of different chemicals. In addition, it can be used for movement. There are some bacteria that slide along surfaces, and they can only do that if they produce this slime layer to be able to move. There's even one bacteria that works like a jet pack. It shoots slime out the back side of it and shoots itself forward. 
The other type of structure is called pili or pillars. Pili are also used for a number of different functions, including movement, attachment, and infection. So pili are short, relatively short appendages that come off the cell. Uh, they can be very stiff, just straight lines coming off or kind of wavy and flexible. And they can be used for movement. Some pili, they, they shoot out a pillus, grab a surface, and then pull the cell forward. It can be used to attach to cells in your body, for example. E. coli uses pili to attach to the urinary tract or the bladder to hold on so that it can cause the infection. Uh, it's also used for gene transfer that we'll hear about next week. And then lastly, we have flagella. Flagella is a classic way that bacteria move. They're extremely long. I can't show them here because it's off the slide. And as you just said, they spin around so that the bacteria can swim through liquid. And so they can swim quite well and quite quickly with a flagella. And again, there are different types of flagella. So uh, now I've talked about everything on, starting from the outside. Now I want to talk a little about the inside. You've got the inside, everything in the inside is called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is not just a bowl full of water or whatever. It's more like a gel inside there. And the cytoplasm includes all the proteins, everything that's inside the cell. You also have DNA, shown here. DNA, uh, in the case of bacteria, is not in a nucleus. Bacteria are prokaryotes, meaning that the DNA is not enclosed by a membrane. In your cells and in plant cells, you've got another membrane surrounding the DNA. This is not true in bacteria. Uh, cells with a nucleus are called eukaryotes, and we're not going to talk much about them. It's up to people. Uh, but these are prokaryotes. Now I'm going to give you a 30-second explanation of DNA, and I will have extra links if you don't already know this. So DNA is the blueprint for the cell. It's organized in genes, and here is DNA. Genes are transcribed into RNA. RNA is a single-stranded copy of the genes that need to be expressed. So your DNA in all your cells is identical, but in, for example, your liver cells, some genes are expressed for liver functions, and in your eyeball, there are different genes expressed. The DNA is all the same, but the RNA will be different. RNA then goes to the ribosome, where it brings the instructions to make proteins. And proteins function both as structural components and also as enzymes in the cell. I'll show one more picture of this. So this here is the DNA, the DNA strand. You have an enzyme called RNA polymerase which binds to the DNA and transcribes a messenger RNA for a specific gene, which then goes to a complex called the ribosome, which uh, translates the RNA into amino acids, which then become proteins. All right? And I realize I did that really fast if you don't know this, but I, there are other links, and we're going to go into more details about this later. So in my little picture here, all these little dots that I've indicated are ribosomes. And I did that because most cells have, or most bacteria, have thousands of ribosomes in them, tens of thousands. And so the whole cell is really full of ribosomes, which allow it to make protein. 
The last thing on here is this little blue circle where I've indicated a plasmid. Plasmid is also DNA, but it's extra DNA. It is not part of the normal chromosome. It's an extra piece of DNA, which in our case, in this course, become really important because they often carry antibiotic resistance genes. They're usually not required for the cell to have. They can move around between cells. So they're extra DNA here. So in summary, overall, the basic structures of a bacteria are the membrane and cell wall, the DNA and the proteins that do the work of the cell as well as play a structural role. In the next section, we're going to discuss how cells grow and divide. So how do cells, bacteria grow? Well, like most things, you need food, okay? So food for bacteria are nutrients of various kinds, but sugars, amino acids, vitamins, nitrogen, phosphate, all the stuff that everyone needs. This food, this, these nutrients, are converted into macromolecules. Macromolecules include RNA, DNA, and proteins. Macromolecules then are produced to make up a new cell. So you need all these macromolecules to make a copy of the cell. If we look in more detail, as shown here, here we have a cell. That's the DNA there. That's a plasmid. Uh, what happens is the DNA is going to copy itself. So it completely copies the DNA into a new um, circle of DNA. This is happening while the cell is getting longer and longer. So the cell is getting longer and longer and longer. The DNA then is pulled to either side of the cell and a division septa is put in the middle here. That septum then forms and creates new cell wall and new membrane between the two new cells, and then the cells divide. So it's essentially they're making clones of themselves. Every new cell is identical. This shows a picture, a real picture, of bacteria that are dividing. This is E. coli. You can see here, this cell is about to divide. You can actually see the septa in the middle. It's about to uh, cut in half the cell. An even closer look is here. Here's the E. coli cell that is about to divide. You can see the septa here. These white blobby things are the DNA. And all the little dots are ribosomes. Now, exponential growth is a concept also called log growth. If you think about it, one bacteria becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's exponential growth. And to give you a sense of how quickly this can happen, I might be able to show you a video or not. So this shows bacteria growing on a slide under the microscope. And it is sped up, of course but it's still incredibly fast within a few hours. Specifically, a bacteria like E. coli can grow every 20 minutes. That's why we, I always mention E. coli because it grows so fast and so easily that we, and is, uh, we have a non-dangerous form of it. We can use it in a lot of experiments. So if you think about that, in less than seven hours, one E. coli will produce one million daughter cells because one becomes two, becomes four, etc. Other bacteria grow much more slowly. For example, Mycobacterium tuberculosis only divides every 24 hours. So how do we grow bacteria in the lab? There are different ways, but one of the ways we work with them is by streaking them on plates, 
Now I'm going to show you this. So this here and this here is an auger plate. The auger plate is like a gel, a semi-firm gel with food in it, basically, for the bacteria. When we want to work with bacteria, we often want to purify them. Let's say I take a sample from Martin here. I might get a uh, 100 different kinds of bacteria. So usually what I want to study are individual species of bacteria. And to do that, I streak them on the plate using a loop, streak them here, and then sterilize the loop or take a new one and streak through the initial one, take a new one or a sterilized one, streak again and streak again. What happens then is I'm diluting out the bacteria as we go along. So I start out with a lot of bacteria and here very few. Each of those little colonies are called started with one bacteria. So in a typical experiment with E. coli, this I would leave overnight and I would see the next day very visible colonies containing one bacteria that grew up into about a million or 10 million. So that's one way we work with bacteria in the lab. The other thing to keep in mind about bacteria is that bacteria divide asexually. Back, eukaryotes, like people, require a sexual phase. So you have male and female. Your offspring is a mixture of the genes from both parents. Bacteria don't have this. Bacteria basically are clones. They divide in half. Every clone is identical. So when I streak them on this auger plate, I end up with a lot of clones, all identical. In addition, bacteria are haploid. What that means is haploid is only one copy of the chromosome, and therefore one copy of every gene is found in a bacteria. On the other hand, a diploid like you, you have two copies of the chromosome, two copies of every gene. You get one from your mother, one from your father. Bacteria don't have that. They have one copy. Okay, so before I take questions, if you wanted to kill a bacteria, what do you think you could do? What could you target or inhibit? If you think about the cell's growth and structure. And in the next section, I'll tell you how some of the antibiotics work. So discuss for a minute. All right, so antibiotics. How do they work and where they come from? Of course, antibiotics, the purpose of the antibiotics are to either kill or stop the growth of antibiotic, uh, bacteria. So what are they? Antibiotics have many different chemical structures. They can target many different structures or processes, including most of the ones you've mentioned in the cell. And they can be man-made or by other organisms. So if we look at antibiotic discovery, I'll show you this. So on the bottom here is the discovery timeline for different classes of antibiotics. So in 1928, we had the discovery of penicillins that I'll talk about more in a minute. Then we had, in the 40s, we had tetracyclines and macrolids. And then in the 80s, we had carbapenems and fluoroquinolones. However, here is our problem. It's been 30 years since we've discovered new antibiotics. There have been a, couple, a lot of variants of these. So, for example, there are better penicillins have been discovered or better fluoroquinolones have been discovered. But completely new classes, there's only a couple that are even in trials here. And that's one of our major problems in antibiotic resistance. And I'll, 
tell you why that is. Because you might think, well, we have a lot of antibiotics. Each of these classes might have 20 antibiotics in them. But above here is the date that resistance was identified. And what you can see is that resistance is identified very shortly after the discovery of the antibiotic. In one case here, it actually happened around the same time, within a, a few months. So resistance is occurring very quickly after the discovery of an antibiotic. While we were discovering new ones, it wasn't so much of a problem. Okay, well, we stop using penicillin, and then we start using the next one. But then we had this, uh, we're in an arms race, so to speak, with bacteria. And the fact that we found so few, and we're going to talk more about why we didn't, haven't discovered any, um, it let it, the bacteria win, so to speak. They started catching up with us. So before we talk more generally about this problem, I'm going to talk, start talking about the first antibiotic here in 1928. And that, that, that antibiotic was penicillin, penicillin, produced by penicillium, which is shown here. It's a fungus. It was a fungus originally found on a Petri dish like this with an auger plate. Uh, later, a variant was found on a melon that was used for most of the production. And the structure of penicillin is shown here. So if you notice this structure, what I want you to notice is this square in the middle. This is the chemical structure of penicillin. That square is going to come back over and over in the center here. So it was discovered that penicillin could kill bacteria, and it was done by this guy, Fleming, in 1928. And the story is that Fleming was a little messy around the lab, and so he had a lot of plates with his bacteria that he was growing, and he left them and went on vacation or went to his summer house for a couple of weeks and didn't clean up before he left. And when he came back, he found this growing on one of the plates. But what was interesting to him is that he could see that some of the bacteria didn't grow around that mold. And he was uh, aware enough of what the implications of that was to continue. I'm going to show you a picture of that. So as I've already shown you, this is an auger plate with bacteria, two different kinds shown here. What he saw, and this is a picture of his actual plate, is he had bacteria all over here. But there was the mold. They contaminated the plate. And around the mold, the bacteria grew very badly, or not at all. So he immediately realized that this was likely some product was being released from the mold and killing off bacteria. That was, isn't the end of the story, though, because just because you have a mold that can do this, you have to produce it somehow. And that was done in large part by Flory and Chan in 1941, who were able to first start purifying penicillin. And they got enough to treat a few patients, but it wasn't very much. Eventually, though, there was a collaboration with industry during World War II. So they took over plants that already existed and did mass production in penicillin. And it was seen as a miracle cure. That was the end of this problem. I mean, they have the sign. I don't think this is true, but penicillin cure is going to read in four hours um, from the 1940s. But this made a huge, huge difference. So now you should be asking yourself, how does penicillin work? Well, I will tell you. Here's my picture again of the bacteria. Penicillin targets the cell wall, which I've already told you about. And specifically, it's going to target this peptidoglycan layer in both gram-positives and gram-negatives. 
So peptidyl glycan provides a structure to a cell. If the peptidyl glycan is destroyed or gets big holes in it, it causes the cell to e explode, essentially. Usually these antibiotics only kill growing cells. Is that's the major time for the cell to make new peptidyl glycan. And they explain that, remember when I showed you a picture of a growing cell, they have to make new peptidyl glycan in the middle there while they're growing. If they're not growing, they're not making new peptidyl glycan. Penicillin targets the enzymes that makes the peptidyl glycan. So as they try to grow, it creates big holes because it can't make new peptidyl glycan. These antibiotics and others in the class have another name called beta-lactam. And that was that square ring I showed you in the chemical structure. These are E. coli growing in the presence of penicillin. And you can see, boom, boom, boom. We call them ghosts after they've exploded. So uh, this is how penicillin basically works in a general sense. If we look more specifically at this, I'm going to show you how this is made. So that peptidyl glycan is made up of two strands connected by peptides. Peptides are like amino acids, uh, or made up of amino acids. So these are sugar uh, glycans and peptides in between. So what's supposed to happen is a protein, let's see if you can see this. You have two peptides here that aren't attached to each other. This enzyme, which we've now named a penicillin binding protein, will bind to two strands uh, or two peptides between the glycan strands and make a bridge there. So that is making in your net the connections between the individual strands. And that is needed for it to be strong. If you add penicillin, it binds to this protein and prevents it from forming new connections in the net. It cannot make new connections in the peptidyl glycan. And as the cell grows, it just becomes loose and big holes in it. And then it explodes. Okay. So I am actually going to stop here. And next time we're going to talk about other antibiotics with different modes of actions, as well as more about beta-lactams.